got lots of people in the room already. Welcome, welcome. So today's topic is, of course, top five design tips for a winning graphical abstract. Some of you may know we're actually running a really exciting graphical abstract contest at BioRender. So lots of big cash prizes. The reason why we're doing this is because, you know, restrictions for COVID, we usually get a chance to travel the world, go to conferences, meet all of you in person. And we generally have, you know, some budget aside so that we can, you know, accommodate our team to travel, to pay for the booth, all of that. But, you know, now we kind of have an overflow of that budget. So we thought, you know, why not do something fun with it and run kind of a graphical abstract contest for all of you to submit your best figures in BioRender. There's uh, hundreds of PIs around the world and editors who have signed up to be judges. And so it's going to be sort of a month and a half long process. I won't go too much into the details of the contest itself. You can read all about it on our website. But this was kind of the impetus behind, you know, why should we kind of run a webinar about graphical abstracts. Um, and besides that, we would love to share some tips and tricks on how to make a better graphical abstract because it's becoming a really important part of the uh, publication and research process. So what we'll cover today is a really brief introduction uh, and then we'll kind of dive into five easy tips for a winning graphical abstract. It's going to be unique to graphical abstracts. It's, a, it's going to be different from what we've covered in previous webinars, say for publications, posters, presentations. And then we're gonna dive into sort of a live figure makeover. Uh, many of you seem to enjoy kind of putting the theory into practice. So we'll do that as well together. Um, a little bit about, my, about myself, if we haven't met already. I'm one of the co-founders of BioRender, my name is Shiz. Background is in medical and biological illustration. And following school, I uh, went to work at National Geographic Magazine. And you know, this is all to say just that uh, we've come with a lot of years of experience on how to communicate complex scientific topics to you know, broad ranges of audiences. And of course, you know, primarily visually. Hey, Chiz, how's it going? Hello, everybody. Hey, Joe. Uh, so I'm Joseph Zeppa. I'll be kind of co-hosting this, um, taking the secondary position to Shiz. And just a little bit of background on myself. So I completed my Bachelor of Science and PhD at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada, uh, focusing primarily in microbiology and immunology. And I actually did my PhD uh, in streptococcal research, so group A streptococcus. I then took my talents to the University of Pittsburgh in uh, Pittsburgh, USA where I uh, was a postdoctoral associate in microbiology and molecular genetics studying tuberculosis. And just less than a month ago, I joined up here at BioRender because I love the product so much and was so excited to use it. Um, and I now am a scientific solutions consultant and customer success manager. And so what, what I primarily do here is um, I help uh, all of our users get the most out of BioRender. And I'm also working on a really cool project we have, which is a COVID-19 therapeutic and vaccine tracker. So if you haven't seen that yet, please go check it out and uh, give us some feedback and some love on it. So we'd really love that. Um, and I think I saw from the poll as well that we had about 30% uh, percent of people who had never used BioRender before and had not signed up for an account. So just on the next slide here, we'll show you a little bit of a GIF of exactly how BioRender works. So BioRender is essentially an online application tool that allows you to create your most beautiful scientific images ever as quickly as possible. So as you can see from the little GIF that's playing on the screen right now, uh, you can see it's as easy as signing in or signing up, uh, opening a blank canvas or one of our editable templates and, click, and simply look, searching for the icons that you want and click and drag them onto the canvas. So it's a very simple, easy and beautiful way to create some fantastic scientific figures. And so another thing where we get a lot of questions here at BioRender is, okay, so I can use this for my publications, but you know, what else can I do with BioRender? And so we've actually got a nice list here showing you exactly um, you know, what we can think of at BioRender that you can use our, uh, our application for. But of course, the sky is the limit. So of course, you can use it in your publications. And of course, for this uh, demo circumstances, graphical abstracts, but we would love for you to use it uh, in a number of avenues, such as your lab meetings, Post, uh, oral and poster presentations. Um, of course, if you're a science educator, use it in your patient education material. And of course, anything else that you can think of. 
And for today, of course, we really want you, uh, you to be focusing on graphical abstracts. So we've created a little bit of a definition of graphical abstracts, both for the purpose of this webinar, as well as for our graphical abstract contest. So what is a graphical abstract? Uh, we've defined a graphical abstract as a single image that is intended to give your uh, reader an immediate understanding of the story or article's main message. Your graphical abstract should be distinct from figures or diagrams in the rest of the article itself, i.e. it should be an overview as opposed to a panel figure in the results section. And so I think with that, Shiz, I'll hand it right on back to you and you can get started with the webinar. Thank you so much, Joe, for that background. And uh, if you have questions for Joe, um, he actually is, uh, you know, very experienced in the research realm, um, in fact, published in Nature this year, I think a few months ago. So if you have questions about what that process was like, I'm sure you can ask him in the chat as well. But he comes with a wealth of knowledge on that front. So thanks so much, Joe. And with that, um, we can kind of dive into the five tips for a better graphical abstract. Um, if you've attended our previous webinars before, you'll notice that you know, the tips are a little bit specific to graphical abstracts. They do have different considerations compared to other types of figure making. So we'll kind of go through these five um, in roughly different amounts of detail, depending on whether we'll dive into it in a demo format. But basically, we'd love for you to you know, plan ahead. So that means to sketch the flow, um, get feedback, and revise accordingly. Um, number two is words to describe the graphical abstract should be, actually be less than the abstract itself. So we'll go through a little bit of color contrast and saturation because you know we love talking about that and that's always one of the most important things for figure making. Uh, number four is to use consistent arrows, lines, and labels. A lot more important than you actually think. It will definitely carry your image through, especially for figures that are very restrictive on space and uh, word count. And number five is a quick gut check. We call it the Twitter or the text message test, and we'll show you what that means uh, in a few minutes. So the first thing we'll kind of go through is to, of course, plan ahead. That means to sketch out your idea, um, you know, think about the flow of information, always get feedback. It's, this is probably the number one thing that, um, you know, across most disciplines isn't done enough, is really getting that feedback from both expertise in your field and even non-technical individuals. Um, here's a really rough, I guess, cheat sheet on different types of flow that I'd recommend for a graphical abstract. Uh, really also for most other figures, but I think almost specifically to graphical abstract in this case. Um, there, you know, you can be creative with your, with your diagrams, but in the design world, there really only are a few ways to uh, align and display information. So that's unidirectional from left to right, up to down. Cyclical is kind of a combination of those. Uh, Z-shape, M-shape, this is probably more familiar with posters when you read from you know, abstract or intro all the way down to conclusions. Um, L-shape is interesting. Sometimes individuals like to put an L-shape diagram together where maybe there's a large central picture that's kind of uh, cradled in that L. Uh, a fork shape is really interesting as well. If you have sort of a decision tree or maybe uh, you know, one entity splitting into two or perhaps two outcomes, uh, you can actually use this fork uh, formation. I wouldn't recommend going in any other direction, however, it should still remain left to right, up to down. So kind of keep this in the back of your mind. This should probably apply to almost every single type of a diagram, every type of figure. And here's an example um, kind of abstracted. We kind of colloquially like to think of it as, you know, tracks on a train or the carts on a train. If you can really compartmentalize each step like this, where they're almost individually identifiable, you know, one to six, A to E, it almost becomes easy to now rearrange everything into different uh, layouts. So here is a sequence shown in cyclical to that Z formation. If you kind of drew your finger over the screen, you can see that it's a Z shape here and then a clockwise circle here. Really the same content. And it does kind of change the communication of the information slightly. The cyclical formation obviously kind of denotes that maybe it goes um, you know, round and around and in a cyclical format. 
Sometimes you're just restricted to a square shape. So sometimes cyclical does help if you're restricted to a square dimension versus a flat horizontal. But really the takeaway here is to kind of condense the number, the picture and the caption, almost like that there are little pictures in and of themselves. And then, you know, arranging them around makes it much easier. Um, here's a little snapshot of, of a kind of figure makeover we did last week of um, kind of a, a rather difficult to follow schematic. Um, the content itself was really interesting. So you can see here it was a, sort of an experiment um, that ultimately resulted in the formation being, it, it looks like a fork. So if you follow from my mouse, it kind of follows in a cyclical format and then it forks from right to left. So a couple of, um, I guess, design no-nos here. But if we go to the next slide, we've kind of arranged it in a way that follows a little bit more in a Z formation. So we picked one of the kind of formats that we felt like it would follow the best. We could have done a fork shape, but because of the amount of steps and the amount of information, it would have been a really long fork. So if you have a lot of steps, that's gonna stretch across um, you know, a long area. Sometimes a Z formation is nice because you can tuck it away into two rows like this, so the before and after. We also decided that that little fork in the road was actually um, able to be prioritized where one fork was more important than the other. And we just kind of let that second um, other kind of path kind of hang off to the side there. So you can make decisions like that where you wanna prioritize a hierarchy of information. Um, especially for graphical abstracts, that's really the main point, as Joe mentioned, to kind of drive the message home with that one simple statement. So that was plan ahead. We also always recommend, you know, at least one or two days of kind of planning ahead time. Uh, you always want to come back with fresh eyes because that is uh, kind of an artist's best friend is to walk away from your painting, walk away from your drawing, come back the next day. And the first thing you see that is an error, that's usually the first thing that other people are going to see as well. So that's a little trick you should take away from this as well, is that that amount of breathing space and the pair of fresh eyes you get when you walk away is actually really, really critical. Um, number two is uh, some, uh, the piece of advice that actually came to me after interviewing um, an editor at Cell Press in preparation for this webinar. Uh, and he said that the words to describe a graphical abstract should actually be less than the abstract itself. So the mistake that uh, he says a lot of uh, authors make is that because the abstract has a word limit, they often think that the graphical abstract does not have a word limit or a picture limit when it really should. So the graphical abstract is not an opportunity to include information that you didn't get to include in the abstract, even though that can be tempting. Uh, really stick with the word limit that uh, you know journals and such kind of instill in the graphical in in the abstract rather. So this is a um, Dr. Tanya Watts's paper from the 2017 edition of Immunity, and um, this was an abstract um, that was translated into a graphical abstract using BioRender, and we thought it was beautifully done. It was kind of a nice sort of antagonistic left and right approach to two pathways and um, really nice sort of like mirror image, very symmetrical, very clean and clear. Um, and actually the abstract itself was really well pared down, so we couldn't really make a critique on this, but just for you know, dem demonstrative purposes, we did pare it down a little bit. So essentially what you do want is if you go backwards, the translation from the graphical abstract into words should again be less than what the abstract is. So I hope I haven't lost you there. Basically, if you go backwards, you shouldn't actually have more words to describe what the graphical abstract is showing as compared to the abstract. So just keep that in mind. Basically, the take home message here is keep your graphical abstracts very simple, very clear, and it should actually be a portion of the abstract itself, um, particularly that take home message. Okay. So number three, four, and five are gonna be a little bit more um, of a demo-related tip. So color, contrast, and saturation, 
if you've attended our previous webinars before, you know that we love talking about this. And the first thing is to just quick review of complementary colors. I'm sure all of you have heard of this before. Um, so red and green are complementary or opposite colors. Uh, so too are blue and orange, as well as purple and yellow. So this is a nice combination of colors if you're kind of showing you know, antagonistic pathways or perhaps um, trying to show kind of the good guy or the bad guy of your story. Using complementary colors or opposite colors on a color wheel can actually help to really uh, separate those two concepts. Another idea to keep in mind is to limit the use of saturated colors. So colors have many, many dimensions. We've got hue, saturation, and value. But for this particular topic, I want to focus on saturation. And that is almost the amount of pigment, or I guess in some cases, you can think of it as a highlighter for your notebook. So you really don't want to go in and highlight your entire page. It's really the, the most important part of the story should be the strongest, most saturated color. And again, you've probably heard us talk about this before, but again, really, really important. Um, as we're seeing the graphical abstracts come in uh, and submitted for the graphical abstract contest, we are seeing uh, beautiful um, and a lot of the times highly saturated pictures. And I think, you know, if you just kind of dial back a little bit of the color use, um, I know it, it gets exciting to make everything into a beautiful color, but it's really a powerful tool if you use it sparingly. And then finally, the idea of color value. So this is really about not the saturation, but the lightness or darkness of a color. In this case, if we swap, again, those top layers of text and words um, and colors into black and white, it completely disappears for the one on the left here. So again, the orange and green are certainly you know, highly saturated. Um, and they're also similar in color value or lightness and darkness. So the take-home message here is to perhaps use a grayscale uh, preview mode. Um, if you really want, you can even print it on an inkjet printer, your final image. I don't really recommend that. I'd probably just you know, use a, a black and white preview. Many apps have this. I know Byrender has this as well. But it really gives a nice sense of if your image has enough color contrast. This is probably I think the number one mistake we see in graphical abstracts, and that is uh, images that are too low in contrast. So in Virender, we have this nifty little preview and grayscale tool. So you see here, um, you can actually switch colors of individual objects in black and white. So you can actually see what it would look like in black and white. And this is not only important for people who actually are fully able to see color, but of course, those that are colorblind, you know, this is going to um, really enhance their ability to consume that information. So again, take home message, try to preview in grayscale, you know, throughout the image making process, but definitely at least at the very end when you do a bit of a gut check. So that was a lot about color. Um, the next one is, also a really important topic, again, for images that are limited in space and text. Um, and that is a consistent use of arrows, lines, and labels. And I'm gonna go into a quick demo here to show you uh, just how powerful different uses of different labels can be. And what I'm gonna do is pop over to uh, BioRender itself. And it sounds like many of you are BioRender veterans, so this is not gonna be um, a surprise to you about what the user interface looks like. But what I'm gonna do is go through um, kind of what we call our tips and tricks. So basically, um, for those again that aren't in, uh, familiar with BioRender, here's an interface. All of my figures are here down below, templates on top. But what we're gonna do is go through a few kind of um, tips and tricks here. One that I love to go through kind of in action is the use of different arrows, as I mentioned. So if you've seen us 
kind of talk about these six types of arrows, then you can probably help out and chime in. Um, but to create something like a feedback loop, you could of course describe it in words, but the best way to do it would actually be to use a circular arrow. Now I'm gonna use uh, an arrow here in BioRender that's called circular. And what this does is creates a perfect 360 degree arrow. I can kind of rotate it. And you can imagine for graphical abstracts again, where again, space is limited, text is limited. I'm gonna create a line fade there. And activation is of course the pointed arrow. Inhibition is a kind of flattened arrowhead. So I'm gonna use that. You see how that switched over? So right away, I'm seeing that there's two different types of arrows. And all of you, you know, you may know this already, but just to keep in mind, the different types of arrowheads denote different concepts. Sometimes I'll even take it a step further and color code the arrows so that it relates a little bit more to the action. Now, if you're inhibiting um, an inhibitor or you know, you're, you're actually activating something that's bad for the body, maybe you'll wanna make this arrow red. So just keep that in mind that the colors you choose to describe the arrows themselves can also communicate something, um, whether you like it or not. So make sure you have control over that message. So that's perfectly circular arrows. You can imagine using it for plasmids and such as well, but that's one really good use of a circular arrow. Um, another is kind of an insider trick we like to use as medical illustrators, and that is the proper use of what we call this sort of line with a dot at the end. You can see here it has this kind of like nub that's not quite an arrow. This is actually really useful for labeling. And we intentionally created this arrow type in BioRender so you can label things. And again, this is different from the arrows that have this pointed arrowhead. This actually doesn't have a point, it has a circle. And these are really useful. I'm just gonna option drag here to make a duplicate. And another one here. But these are really useful because it can, you can actually bend and sway these according to where on the object you're labeling. And why that's important is that you actually want the line to come out parallel to the word. Otherwise you get this weird kind of star shape or kind of spider leg look to it. This way, um, you know, no matter how many words you try to cram in, you can actually end up you know, really cramming in as much as you like, but it kind of looks and stays consistent. So imagine you had, you know, multiple things to label. Just having those parallel lines coming out of that um, word actually does help quite a bit. So keep in mind the arrow with this kind of elbow and dot at the end is really good for labels. And sectioning is really interesting. Um, this might relate a little more to um, sort of future and past states. Um, I'm gonna use this sort of curved and dotted line. So our, our artists have actually created, um, I don't know if you can see, I'm gonna zoom in my browser. These kind of dotted lines or pre-dotted lines. So in every option, there's sort of these pre-dotted lines here. So I'm gonna select this one, zoom out a bit so you can see. And I'm gonna draw a dotted line. And when I do that, it actually creates really nice um, kind of demarcations. Maybe it's describing the section that's going to be cut. So if it's like a surgical incision, um, I'm sure you've seen those paper, call, paper doll cutouts as kids. Um, and I'm gonna option drag here just to speed things up. By the way, if you're confused about the shortcuts that I'm using, um, here's a little cheat sheet here on the side. We've got all the keyboard shortcuts you can use in BioRender there. That's just this little keyboard. Sorry, I was zoomed way in here on my browser. Um, so you can see there that it kind of creates this sectioning look and feel without it looking too um, kind of stripey. If it, if it was a solid line, you wouldn't really know if it was part of the structure or not. Of course, same goes for maybe a more circular line. I'm gonna kind of remove the, the fill 
and make the border white and then dash the line like so. So sometimes you wanna show a dotted line for maybe um, a shrinking or growing tumor. So if I were to um, copy and paste this and then maybe make this into a smaller line, it kind of looks like this tumor shrunk or this tumor is growing, um, depending on maybe you know, what your story looks like. So there's a tip on how to kind of use dotted lines to your advantage. Again, very different from label lines and very different from this feedback, feedback loop, but all within the sort of arrows and lines category. Um, here's another one. So if you don't have enough room for words, sometimes just thickening and thinning out the arrow itself can help tell the story. So if I were to show the movement of bile and the movement of blood through the portal vein in the body, simplified into arrows, the first thing I do is maybe color code it to make it look like the thing that it's um, describing. So green for bile and maybe blue for the portal vein. And you know the volume of blood, if I wanna show that it's much greater coming from the intestines to the liver to be um, you know, purified, like so. Very, very simple. Without saying a single word, I've basically just described um, a difference in volume um, of liquid. It could be in concentration, it could be in power, it could be in volts, whatever it is, the size of the arrow can also denote uh, a differential. Okay, so keep that in mind, how arrows could be your friend in showing those differences. Um, transcription and translation or transcription of DNA, pretty straightforward. Um, you're gonna want an arrow with a perfect 90 degree. So we have that as well in BioRender. So basically you can make a perfect 90 degree angle and then switch it from inhibitor to promoter really quickly like so, just by changing the arrowhead. Okay, so make sure you're using that perfect 90 degree angle to, to describe that. That's just a you know, kind of known and commonly accepted um, symbol for that. Um, and then movement, this is really interesting. So this is kind of one of our favorite arrows and that's this sort of faded curved arrow. And it kind of gives that swoosh sound visually. Um, if I were to type in cytokine or maybe dots even, let's see, we've got some dots. Drag those out. And what you can do is basically look for the icons you need in BioRender, search in the search bar, and then just drag it out onto your composition here. So you can see here, if this wasn't present, you can still kind of get an idea that it's gonna dock onto this uh, transmembrane protein, but this arrow really kind of helps tell that story. So what I've done here is added a line fade. So here it's with, without the fade, here is with. Um, I've also decreased the opacity. So if it was at full strength, sometimes it's a little too strong. It looks like it's, you know, the main part of the story. But if you fade it out, it can kind of show the general sort of spray of molecules coming towards that protein. If it was taking a really unique path, maybe you'd want to make it, you know, bend or sway. That is possible in BioRender as well. We've got really flexible arrows. Um, but just so you know, again, arrows can tell a really, really complex story without saying, you know, the molecules will kind of swerve and sway through the cellular environment. Just by using a curved arrow like this, it can tell the entire story in a sort of, you know, language agnostic way. Okay, so that's a lot about arrows and lines. I think that's enough for today. Uh, I'm gonna navigate back to my folder here and see if we can um, answer any questions in the chat. Looks like we're doing okay. Francesca and Joe are vigorously typing to answer all of your questions, so thank you so much. Um, back onto the topic of our uh, really fun sort of graphical abstract contest happening right now. If you get your BioRender account, it's free to sign up. Just go to um, biorender.com. And again, what we're doing is we're giving away $50,000 in cash prizes. 
and several categories. So you have a lot of opportunity to win something. And here's all of the beautiful entries already coming in from scientists like yourselves all over the world. Got hundreds and hundreds, and hundreds already submitted. So what I've done is I've reached out to a few of you to ask if I can um, maybe kind of pick at your figure and see if um, you know, there's a couple of things I would have done differently just to enhance the way that it was communicated. I think a lot of them are very successful. So what I've done is picked one that I think was actually very successful in the storytelling and um, just a couple of things maybe that I would have done a little differently if I were to have started from scratch you know, as a medical illustrator. So here's one of them. Um, the concept here was is around autoimmune error of cellular mechanism in celiac disease. So we've got a lot of really interesting things happening here. We've got some anatomical views. We've got cellular, cellular interactions. Um, we've got an epithelial kind of tissue level. We've also got some molecules and cytokines spraying. So I'm sure a lot of you can relate to a lot of the elements on this kind of screen. Um, and going back to what I talked about, you know, thinking about from the ground up, what is sort of the general flow of the story? So I think we're probably in the territory of sort of combining a couple of um, uh, formats or flow of information. So what I like to do is actually go to pencil and paper and literally just sketch out what I want the composition to be like. So what I have is um, Photoshop open, and I'm using Photoshop just to show you how I'd sketch it out because I don't, I couldn't show you on pencil and paper, but I would actually usually just do it on paper. Um, and what I'd like to do is kind of draw over this person's graphical abstract and maybe I'll pick a more red color so you can see. And I'm using my stylus here on my screen so you can see, whoops. So I think there's something happening here where the story starts in the top left. So that's great, that's a good, that's a good start. Um, and then something's happening where I think it's pulling off to the side and then I'm having to kind of flip my head 90 degrees to see what's happening here. So it looks like they're telling me that, you know, some of these molecules fly down this way. Um, and then making my marker bigger, it kind of flows out this way. Uh, and then generally takes a loop and the cytokines affect the cells there. There's kind of this uh, smaller offshoot happening off to the side and then maybe these kind of affect the cells as well, maybe like a secondary reaction. Um, so you can see here we're kind of going generally clockwise, but um, because I'm having to turn my head a little bit, it's um, becoming a little bit difficult to follow the story. So if I were to set this up differently, again, don't be afraid to start from scratch. Um, you don't have to throw away all the elements and the hard work you've done. All you have to do is kind of rearrange it. And sometimes that's the majority of the work is just rearranging things and making it a little bit more legible. So if I were to redraw this, maybe I'll pick a black, black marker now just so it's not too intense. Um, maybe I'd, I'd, I would keep the intestines up here. I kind of like that, you know, they're keeping the one with the layers because that's what's important in the story. Um, you know, have a couple of molecules and keep that floating. Sometimes to denote text, I'll just do something like this to show, okay, there's gonna be a paragraph of text there. Um, I do like this kind of motion. I think what I do is definitely keep the orientation from left to right. So have a row of cells without me having to, you know, turn my head and reorient myself. And this has to, this necessarily has to be very messy and quick. It should be just kind of your brain to your hand, to pencil, to paper. Um, maybe I'll even put a square here to show that we're gonna zoom into this area. So again, orient your viewer. I think they did a, a pretty good job here because they added this um, intestine on the left to kind of tell us that, you know, I've, I've reoriented here, so don't get confused. Um, 
And then what I do is try to maintain a general flow from left to right. I think we can't really get away from this counterclockwise flow, however, because it is telling us that it's affecting some cells downstream. So, you know, maybe we'll have some damaged cells in this area, like so. And then these kind of offshoots, you know, we'll just keep it pretty soft off to the side. But as I mentioned, we do want that main story to flow this way. So that whoever comes to our graphical abstract, they're gonna know which way to read, left to right, up to down. Maybe I'll even add a few numbers in here. So if this is the first step, maybe there's a two here, maybe there's a three, and maybe the fourth is the final damaged um, enterocytes. So with that in mind, let's go back to um, BioRender. If this was pencil on paper, even better, because I can just have it on the side of my screen, on a post-it, or you know, on my desk as I'm going through and illustrating it. So if I navigate back here, I'm gonna tuck away the library. This little arrow is gonna close up the library so I have more room in BioRender. And for the sake of time, um, I actually have some pre-made labels here. I've basically just, um, I guess, flipped this about 90 degrees. So what I did was I literally just flipped the composition and all of the pieces that they sent to me by 90 degrees, and then I flipped it um, this way. So now we're reading backwards here, but just to show you, um, this is generally the flow that I decided to go with. So I flipped it 90 degrees, and then I flipped it on its, um, I guess, vertical axis. Um, so it's now horizontally flipped. And so that flow, I think, reads much better. Um, I'm just gonna go back to the original here so you can see the before. Um, and then after that, there's probably a couple of small things I'd probably like to um, fix up here. So one is, I guess we should just finish the figure and add in some cells, enterocytes. Um, I could use this row of cells here. This looks pretty good. I can kind of, you know, alt drag and keep going like this. That's probably good enough for my use case. Um, I do want to highlight our beautiful new brush feature. You'll know that some of our icons here have this little blue icon called a brush. Um, so what I'm going to do is drag that onto the canvas. Looks pretty similar to the previous icons I just dragged out. But instead of copying and pasting, I can actually just pull the end of this and it'll add enterocytes as I drag it. And now this is really cool because you can get pretty fancy with the shape of the enterocytes. So here's an example of one that is a little bit more complex. You can change the arch and the angle if for some reason that's important to you. So you can see it kind of recalculates and gets really bendy and sway. So really neat. In fact, even for this straight one, you can curve and bend it. So you couldn't do this with a regular row of icons, of course. And you can see it recalculates into this curved motion. Um, I don't really need it to curve for my illustration, so I'm gonna make it straight again, and then just kind of line it up to be straight. Um, maybe I want it to be a little smaller. I'll try to generally match maybe the size of the killer T cells. Okay, so that's looking good. Um, I'm gonna want to independently edit these cells. So what I'm gonna do is expand it like so. Now these brush features are available on the premium feature of BioRender, um, but you can actually use the uh, brush feature if you sign up for a free trial. Um, again, it's a risk-free kind of two week free trial, you can try all the bells and whistles of BioRender just to see if it's something that uh, would be of interest to you. Um, so I can double click now, and indeed these are now editable pieces. So even if you don't do work on you know, digestion or enterocytes, um, you can imagine using our vessels brush maybe, or our membrane brush, or DNA brush, anything that might require a little bit more 
um, flexibility in the way that you're illustrating rows of cells or entities. Um, what I'm going to do is maybe make some of these cells look a little bit more damaged. Um, maybe I'll make it kind of pink. Uh, and then maybe a few of these will be like really dark and red. Like so, and then kind of add a little gap. I think that's what the story is saying is that there's some compromise in the um, in the lining. And I think these little yellow guys, intraepithelial lymphocytes, they were kind of sandwiched in between. So we can put those back in place, move it to the front so it's visible. All right. And you can see that the colors that I've selected, again, are very um, selective. So the bright red is really reserved for you know, the damaged area. If this entire row was really, really bright, it'd probably be a little bit distracting. Um, and I'm actually gonna move this whole row with these little emphasis to the back so that the text can come out to the front, send to back. There we go. Um, move this label down here. And let's see, what else can I do to fix this up? Um, I think one thing I do is look at the text hierarchy of this image. So the biggest thing I see is small intestinal lumen and gluten. Otherwise, everything else looks really, really small and a little hard to read. So specific to our graphical abstract contest, we do recommend anywhere between 10 to 12 size font at a minimum, because you know if our judges who are you know, peers like yourselves, mostly PIs and editors of journals that will be reviewing your graphical abstract for the contest, they're gonna need to read what the content of the graphical abstract is. So I'm gonna go in and select all the text. Actually, I'm gonna do edit, select all text in BioRender. This is actually a really, fast option to select all the text on your page. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is make sure it is size 10 at least. What does that look like? Let's try 11. 11 looks good. Let's see if we can push 12. 12 is even better. I think we can get away with 11 in this case. So already much more legible compared to before. It's looking better. Um, what I also like to do is talking about text hierarchy. And remember, we want, we want to tell one story or one main story. So anything that's kind of a distraction or kind of a you know, supporting actor role, we want them to um, just you know, kind of sit, sit back a little bit as far as intensity. So small intestinal lumen, microvilli, enterocytes, lamina propria, these are just labels for anatomy, which I think at least this level of detail, this level of technicality, your audience should probably know. This is just kind of a reminder at that by that point. So I'm going to italicize them to make it look like they're just, you know, um, labeling background elements. Maybe I'll make the text even like a gray, as if to say, even if for some reason this doesn't show up in the final print, of course it will, but you know, even if it doesn't, it might be okay because it's actually just um, you know, a reminder label. There we go. Um, this intestinal lumen label is getting a little lost. If I view in grayscale, you can see that it's almost completely gone. So what I'd probably do is just make that one a little bit more intense because it does have background to compete with. So go back here and make it a little darker. There we go. Um, okay, so that's looking good. It's almost looking like a nature image. And uh, let's see, what else could we do to improve this? Um, this looks like an, it's an important paragraph, so it should maybe be a little bit different from the label. So I'll make it a size 12, like so. Um, let's see. 
this little skinny arrow that sounds like it looks like it's one of the most important parts of the story is also getting a bit lost. So what I'm going to do is make this the boldest and biggest arrow in the story so that you know my viewer's eye knows exactly where to go first. And then the other ones are kind of telling side stories in a way. So let's see, make this maybe even a blue color to match the cytokines that it's representing. I'll just kind of hover those molecules around that arrow. And a lot of it's just going to be kind of pushing and pulling, you know, adding little elements here and there. So it's already looking much better, I think. And uh, let's see, one thing I'd also add is perhaps some numbers. Um, numbers are going to be really key to drawing your viewer's eye around the page. So what I like to do is grab the, the little circle with the letters in it here under shape. And what that's gonna do is when I shift, click and drag a perfect circle, I can actually double click into the circle now, double click and kind of add in whatever I want. So maybe it's A, maybe it's a one, but this way, if I shift drag to make it smaller, um, I can start making little perfectly centered label numbers. So maybe this is step one, or maybe this is step one rather. Maybe this is step two. I'm just gonna arbitrarily start adding in numbers here. Um, and I'm also alt, oh sorry, option dragging to duplicate the object if you're wondering how I'm able to do this. Um, Step three. And then maybe these are numbers that you actually call out in the abstract itself, but you know you don't have to really label it in the image. Maybe this is step five. But now there's almost no confusion as to you know which order to read your image. You've explicitly set it by numbering it. Um, I'm just gonna make it a black border. That's much easier to see. And then it looks like there's a faint fill color, so I'll just make it white. Okay, there we go, already looking much better. Um, what else can we do here to make it a little more clean? Um, if you really want, you can add a background color. Now we recommend being uh, very careful with adding background colors. As you saw, you know, the idea of color value is very important to make sure that your foreground elements are brighter or darker or at least a very different contrast color than um, the background elements. So if we make this maybe a slight pink or fleshy color, um, that might help tell our story a little bit better. You can see here we're getting, um, it's getting a little lost, the background elements. So Sometimes what I recommend is using a gradient. Now again, this is very dangerous territory because gradients can be um, very difficult to do tastefully. So sometimes what I do is I actually make a gradient of the same color, but one is just kind of going into a transparent zone. Um, flip it around. There we go. So it kind of adds a very, very soft, soft background, kind of creates the illusion of depth. But this is probably the level of darkness I would go for a background for a graphical abstract. So just keep that in mind. Unless you're going total, total dark with white text on top, this is the level of contrast I'd highly recommend. So let's preview this by clicking preview. Already looking much better, I think. And see if we're missing any elements here. Ah, we should add a little box to show that this is the area that we're zooming into. Um, and again, remove that fill and maybe make it a black border. So there we go. Now it's kind of showing that uh, indeed we are kind of zooming into this area and that's the area of interest and that's kind of what's zoomed in here. Maybe I'm gonna make it a thicker border, like so. 
and it looks pretty good. Let's go back to our sketch and see if it's anything similar. And it's looking pretty good. If we do side by side, I think we've got the general flow down. But I actually always do this. I go back to my really messy napkin drawing and see, did I get the gist of it in the final? Because sometimes in the final, you get so caught up in the little details and the pixels that you forget what the general flow is. So I think we did a pretty good job there of maintaining that general, you know, one to five. Okay, so I'm gonna just actually quickly screenshot this. I don't recommend screenshotting because it will, you won't get a high quality image in the final. Um, here is the after. So if we were to kind of toggle the before and after here, I think we did a pretty good job of the improving the flow to read left to right and kind of orient your viewer. So again, there's a before and then applying everything we learned in today's session kind of to make a better flow for your reader. So this is just one example. Hopefully you can kind of look at and think of ways that you can improve your own figure I have a few kind of last tidbits here um, because as I mentioned, we are running a graphical abstract contest. We're starting to put together a little, I guess, how to guide or a manual. So if you'd like, here's kind of some of the things we talked about today, going through stepwise in a little more detail. We're gonna be adding some more um, visual cues on how to create a winning graphical abstract specific also to our contest. So everything in blue has been color coded to tell you, you know, maybe don't follow these rules to submit to a journal, but the blue areas are gonna help you win um, a lot of our prizes for the graphical abstract contest. So I think what I'll do is um, post the, uh, let's see here. Post it in the chat. Here is the doc there, if you'd like to take a look. I think it's an open doc, so you can just download the PDF version. It looks like there's over 30 people on the doc right now. So this is that. Um, and then last tip that I didn't go through and I said I would is that kind of Twitter slash text message test. Um, basically, this is the last tip that the editor in my interview with him from Solid Press told me about. And that's basically, you know, a lot of these sort of journals request graphical abstracts so that it can be shared widely on social media in a really quick snapshot. So the idea here is that, for example, this is one that was um, just posted a couple of days ago from a Cell Press article. You can see that when I click in, it can be very readily shared, very clear to understand. And uh, really we don't have room or character limits to write the abstract itself. So the information has to uh, be very clear on generally speaking, a you know, five by five or a seven by 10 kind of a format. All right, so if you can text this picture to your friend and they can kind of text back to you what you know they think is happening in the story in not too much of a strenuous way, then you've done your job. But it should be relatively independent of the graph of the abstract itself and be descriptive enough. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And I highly encourage you to submit your graphical abstracts to our contest. It's really easy. All you do is sign up for your free BioRender account. There's no fees associated with this contest. It's literally, it's free. It's just a fun way for us to all kind of see what everybody is working on. Look at the really beautiful abstract, graphical abstracts submitted already in the contest. So some really creative ones in here. And hopefully, you know, after our webinar, you can kind of see a thing or two that maybe you'd like to implement in your graphical abstract to really make it shine. So go ahead and submit your figures to the BioRender Gallery. You can actually upvote for your friends as well. So you can 
hit upvote and comment. Um, some really beautiful examples here you can take inspiration from. I do recommend though following closely our submission guideline and this kind of design guide because it will help you um, at least you know, put together your figure in an easy to understand way. Hey Shiz, I too just wanted to say thank you to everybody for participating and thanks for all the great conversations and questions in the chat box. And we really look forward to seeing all of the uh, beautiful figures that you're gonna create for the contest. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joe. Thanks, Brigitte, as well. I think she was very busy <laughs> answering all, the, all of your questions. So hopefully we were able to get to all of them. You were super engaged and really appreciate uh, your enthusiasm. All right, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you stay safe wherever you are in the world and definitely join us for our next webinar. We have lots more coming in the coming weeks. So I look forward to seeing you again there. All right, everyone. Thanks. Take care. And don't forget to sign up for your free account. It's just at www.fireunder.com. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day or night. <laughs>